الله الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ومن آياته أن خلق لكم من أنفسكم أزواجا لتسكنوا إليها وجعل بينكم موزة ورحمة إن في ذلك لآية لكم يتذكرون صدق الله العلي العظيم قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم النكاح من سنتي فمن رغب من سنتي فليس مني أو كما قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم صلى الله عليه وسلم ما جئت أكيد أن نصومه Mawlana, Allah, Allah bless him with health, with power, with the ability to keep enlightening you all. My, our brother, Brother Bilal, my respected elders, beloved youngsters, brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Alhamdulillah, we got to listen to a you know, all inspiring you. Uh, I only, uh, unfortunately, I, I ask for forgiveness that I arrived about five minutes, a few minutes before Mother, and I put the last few moments of uh, Sidi Bilal's talk before Mother, and then after Mother, mashallah, a beautiful rendition, beautiful poem. He, he, you know, he encompassed an entire lifetime of feeling and emotion in the space of about five to ten minutes. SubhanAllah, that's a gift, a gift in itself. Um, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continue to enable Sidi Bilal to enlighten and in, in, inspire us all. For no doubt we are in need of, in desperate need of inspiration as a community, especially young Muslim brothers and sisters living in the UK. Yeah? They need of, desperate need of inspiration. And we, you know, gone of those days, you know, the, the ulama, whenever the ulama stand up on the member, they say, we need not look further for a role model than Sayyidina Rasulullah. Sayyidina Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the best role model. And that is true. لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ مُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا And in the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, مُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا You have the most perfect of examples. Wow. However, However, sometimes our ulama forget to mention and add that it's an extremely difficult example to follow. We need to understand that the Prophet وسلم, was at the pinnacle of perfection. Perfection in terms of his akhlaq. Everything that the Prophet وسلم, said, everything that he did, it had the pinnacle, it was at the pinnacle of perfection. And it's difficult to reach those, to us, unattainable heights. It's extremely difficult to do that. And we need to look at role models living among us. Yeah? We need to look at role models living, living among us. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he gave the perfect example when he sent Sayyidina Muhammad to Yemen, Radiallahu Ta'ala Anhu to Yemen. And when he sent him to Yemen to do da'ah, to do tabliq, wow. yeah, he sent Mu'ad as their imam. And he said, if you have any problems, ask the community to come to you. For you are the one whom they should seek inspiration from. Wow. So the Prophet said, Allah, not only was he the best role model himself, he created role models. Wow. And he wanted people to become role models for others. So that people are inspired and come to be the Alhamdulillah, we have that today. We have that within our community, uh, especially in the UK, we have so many young brothers and sisters as role models. We can look to them, you know. I know I meet my role models daily. I meet them daily. Anybody I can seek inspiration from, I see them as my role model, you know. There are some people that you will take so much from, yeah. There's others you may take little from. But nevertheless, you'll be taking something. There is a qaida. The qaida, I, I, I heard this in a, in a talk, one of my shiluk in, in, in Asad, 
mention this, this is one of the reasons why when Sidi Bilal mentioned Ahli and Zamalik and living in Medina al Nasr in, 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 in Cairo, I actually lived in Medina al Nasr for five years myself. Um, mashallah, uh, whenever Cairo is mentioned, I get a bit, you know, emotive myself. Uh, I, I love that place, mashallah. Um, there's a comment that I heard from one of my few, and it's quite beautiful in Arabic. It's, that the suhda, the companionship of kiram and akhyari, of kind, generous, good people, to rizu kutna dhanni bil ashar, it breeds the best of opinion about the Ashar, the worst of people. So good companionship breeds the, an excellent opinion of the worst of people. Subhanallah. <laughs> and the companionship of evil, corrupt people to it breeds the worst of opinion about the best of people. How true is that? That you stay in the company of good, kind, generous people who practice their deed, who are on the top, it will breed the best of opinion about the worst of, worst of people. And if you stay with corrupt people who have no sense of deed inside them, then what will it breed? It will breed within you the worst of opinion about the best of people. When you see some good people and someone says to you, this brother, look at Muslim Bilal, look at this brother, look at that brother, subhanAllah, look how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us. And you are, you're going to be, you're always going to be the pessimist. You're going to say, what's so special about them? Who are they? These people who you call the best of people. No, I'm much better than them. That's what happens when you spend time <coughs> with the worst of people. So we need to make or look towards our brothers as, as, as role models, our brothers and sisters and sisters that are listening also. And we have so many examples, great examples. You know, uh, I met a sister um, the other day at one of our talks and she came uh, afterwards and she handed a piece of paper. She put it on the table after one of the talks. And she went and, and, and stood on to the side and, and I, I looked and smiled and I, I, uh, I, I teared up uh, due to her modesty, the modest outlook that she had. And I, and I picked up the piece of paper and she says that, you know, ulama, she mentioned something along the lines of ulama and aimma, uh, imams are always talking about women and how they have a huge status in Islam, how much we should respect them and honor them. Can you give us you know, yet, uh, they do not mention any women as role models who we, as young women living in Britain, can aspire to be like. Yeah? Or can aspire to reach some sort of a level close to them. And the, not many examples are given. And I say, SubhanAllah, you know, if you open up the books of, books of Tariq and the books of Hadith, of history and Hadith, we will see numerous examples of women in every single field. You want professional working women and you want, you're, if you're a professional working woman and you need an ex, uh, a role model to aspire to be that, then look at the likes of uh, Sayyidah Khatija radiallahu ta'ala and the blessed wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She was a professional, honest, working woman at the top of the chain. At the top of the chain. And her taqwa shone through. SubhanAllah. You need to look at uh, women in terms of, 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 of their fearlessness and bravery. Look at the likes of the first woman or the first individual that was martyred for the sake of Allah and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sayyidah Sumayya radiallahu ta'ala anha. May Allah be pleased with that. The first individual to give her life for or to give their life for Islam as a woman. Sayyidah Sumayya radiallahu ta'ala anha. You need to look for examples or role models for young university students who are studying, who want to go, 
you know, and get a degree, and get a stable job with a stable income. SubhanAllah, look at the life of Sayyidah Aisha radiallahu ta'ala who aside from being Ummul Mu'mineen, the, the mother of the believers, she was also, she was also what? She was also a muhaddith. She was also a mufassir. She was also a muhaddith. She was somebody whom the greatest of the Sahaba would come to and seek advice from. The greatest of the Sahaba. Said the life of Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Abbas. The life of Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Umar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with both of them. To lead us from the Sahaba Ikram in terms of their knowledge. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prayed for both of them. For one of them he said, Allim, Ya Allim al-Ta'eel. Our Lord teach him ta'eel. Teach him how to derive blessings and benefit from the verses of the Quran and how to interpret them in the best manner. Another one, he taught him the hadith. Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Umar is in the top five narrators who are narrated the most hadith from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So these individuals will come to say to Aisha radiallahu ta'ala and they will write a hijab from behind the hijab and they will pose questions to her. You know, you have the life of Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Zubair radiallahu ta'ala who sacrificed his life for Islam. Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Zubair was the son of who? Sayyidina Zubair ibn Awam who was from the Ashar al Rasha, the Hajar al The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, As Zubair ibn Jannah. Zubair is in Jannah, wow. and who was the blessed mother of Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Zubair? Sayyidina Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, the daughter of, of Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anha, the sister of Aisha, the elder sister of Aisha. Subhanallah. If we were to talk about just Sayyidina Asma bin Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anha, we'd be here all night. And they produce sons like Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Zubair radiallahu ta'ala anha who was the nephew of Sayyidina Aisha. So he would come constantly. He didn't need a hijab. There, was, he, they, there didn't need to be a hijab between him and his aunt. And he would come to Sayyidina Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha and seek blessings from her, seek knowledge from her. So she was the leader of the Sahaba ikram of men. And when we say, when we talk about that, I know the topic of discussion is marriage and, and illicit relationships here. Yeah? You look at the Quran, there's a verse of the Quran which talks about Al-Rijal Kaum, Awamun Al-Nisa. The Rijal, the men, Awamun are the maintainers and the protectors Al-Nisa, of women. Yeah? And many men take this, um, this verse, yeah? and you know how we nitpick, and we, we like to choose things that benefit us. Yeah? It's like, um, let me give you an example. You know, parents who do not know the Quran, who haven't learned the Quran, who haven't read the Quran, but they know one verse like the back of their hand, and they repeat that daily. What is that verse? Wabil walidini ihsana. And to your parents, show ihsan and show kindness to them. Every parent knows that verse. If not every, then the vast majority of them do. Why? Because it benefits them as a parent. It benefits that individual. But if my son does anything wrong, bring him here and say, don't you know? Bring more of these tell you that they must shift. That to your parents, you should know kindness to them. If you ask them to point out the verse of the Quran where it's mentioned, they have absolutely no idea. But they know this, this will be at the tip of their tongues. Yeah? In exactly the same way, there are some men. Yeah? And you know uh, the word Arajun in, 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 in Arabic? It comes from the, from the verb rajala, to stand on one's two feet. Yeah? So just merely because you have testosterone doesn't make you a rajal. It does not make you a man. A man is one who stands on his two feet. Yeah? And in history, in the books of, of language, in the books of Nuga, rajal has been used to describe women also. So don't think that it's just specifically for you. But I'm talking about those men. Those macho men. Yeah? And who are those macho men? They bench one dip here. Yeah? <laughs> Not those ones. Yeah? I'm talking about those macho men who think that it is their divine right or a God-given right to them yeah? to tell others about their responsibilities towards them. And this is the basic principle in marriage.
challenge. You know? The basic principle is do not think about your rights. Do not talk about your rights. Instead, discuss your obligations. Imagine if every single who's married here, can, can you raise your hands for the brothers who are married? Subhanallah. MashaAllah. Both of you. Is that true? Nasna wa tulata wa ruba. Allah bless you and Allah bless your married lives and make them blissful. Yeah? Now, every one of you who is married will agree with one fact. What is that fact? Siri, are you married? MashaAllah, Allah bless you. Yeah? We'll agree with one fact that you're going to argue. There are arguments. There's no doubt about that. Yeah? There is not a single marriage couple or married couple in the world that can claim and say we are 100% perfect and we are 100% perfect for each other. There has never been a raised voice. There has never been, you know, an angry stare. There has never been, you know, an angry silence. There has never been any of that. You know, or God forbid, you're backhand. Don't do that. Like, don't, don't, do, don't do that. Um, Allah bless you. You know, every married individual will agree that there are differences. People are going to have differences in opinion. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us differently. Men and women have been created different. You know, I, I was listening to one of my shayyu friends and he had the... Alhamdulillah, he was married twice, so he had two, two wives, and he was talking, he was just joking to us as his students, as, as one would, not in a classroom setting, uh, just talking about, you know, the differences that he has to face. He said, listen, it's difficult to maintain one marriage. I'm having to maintain two of them, yeah? And then he was, he was, he was informing us of how difficult that it, can, it, it, it really can be. And he mentioned something that, that quite, you know, that shook me to the core. Yeah. This Shaykh Allah bless him, he said that we think that when we're getting married, that we're completing our deen. Yes. Or it's half of our completing half of our deen. That that's the purpose of marriage. We go into marriage and we go into it for the wrong reason. Now what are the wrong reasons? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has told us what the right reasons are. So anything other than those reasons is the wrong reason. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, when you marry, marry for four reasons. What are those reasons? Lema'liha for her wealth. Lema'sabiha or lehasabiha for her, for her nasab, for her lineage, her family lineage, and she come from a, 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 a well-established family, you know, a well you know, a, a well-known, respectable tribe, or in our case, if we're, well, and I say ours, I'm pointing to my own uh, nationality, being from a Pakistani, Muslim background, you know, uh, you know, is that person, and where Jodhis and Rajas and so forth, and things like that, you know, everybody, everyone has that sort of something that they aspire to be like, you know, we, we have this, these tribal influences, in every nation you have that, you have that in the nation of of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in the Arabs, you have the Quraysh. From amongst the Quraysh, you have the uh, the uh, uh, the Hashim, yeah, the Banu Hashim, who were regarded as the leaders of the Quraysh tribe and therefore the leaders of for the Arabs. So you have that everywhere, and this is something that we all need to refrain from. So there's the Nimariha, the Nasabiha for her lineage. What else? Yeah. What else? Beauty, the Jamaiya, for our beauty. And see which brother said that. Shout out, beauty, beauty. I look nowadays, that's the first thing that we look for, naturally. Yeah? Beauty. Yeah? Oh? Oh? Or the last one? Nobody? Basically. The most important one. The Deeniha. For her Deen. And the Prophet said, Allah, after informing you of the four choices, or in the of the four choices, what did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say? First, first of all, that being. And when you make your choice, make it in regards to Adin. And this applies to both men and women. That when they get married, don't look at how rich, or for our lady, for our, for our sisters, don't look at how rich he is, how many houses he has, what flashy car he drives, or how handsome he is. For our brothers, don't look how beautiful she is in 
the clothes that she wears, which might be revealing for enough for you to see her beauty, yeah? Or to you what you perceive as to be her beauty, don't look at whether she has a well-established job, whether she will be able to take care of you, yeah? In terms of money financially, which is generally a rejal kawamun al nizari in the back of that point, and the men are the maintainers and protectors of women. Our head of Tabidi is that Tafsir al Dahr al He mentioned something extraordinary that no other Mufassir as of yet, which I read, has mentioned. He said this word, right, of rijal, can be used to describe both men and women. So if the man, or if the man is doing his jihad, and his jihad is what? Huh? Bringing food to the table, taking care of his family, controlling his desires, suppressing his desires. If he's doing all of that, being a true Arabi, praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala consistently, huh? but then he is then he is the maintainer and protector of, of his women or his wife. However, if the woman is doing her jihad, she's doing her duties and she's fulfilling them in their entirety and the man is relaxed, he's not doing anything, he's sitting with his behind at home expecting that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give him everything without him having to work for it, then the woman becomes the Quran. Then she becomes the maintainer and protector of the man. This is mentioned by Abu Hayyad Tawhid in his in Tafsir Bahr al-Muhid and he's a great scholar, subhanAllah. So know that when you choose somebody to get married to, choose them for the right reasons. If you choose them for the wrong reasons, then what happens? That marriage is destined to fail. You know, and nowadays, we, what we perceive to be the right reason is the wrong reason. A man, well, a brother came to me and he said to me, this is about a couple of years ago, when I was still in Cairo at the time and I had come back for, for, my, my, for Ramadan. And I gave a talk somewhere and he came up to me and he said, you yeah, Sheikh, you do dua for me. Inshallah, you do dua for me, inshallah, you do dua for me, you do dua for me. He said, a specific dua for me. Yeah? Do a dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protects me from sin. And you know, I get married. You don't understand. I'm having to suppress my desires. I need to get married. And do dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala finds me, you know, such a spouse that I can, you know, be happy. And I said, you know what? Nowadays, that many brothers feel that that's a legitimate excuse to get married. They feel that that's a legitimate reason to get married. And you know what? They regard that as the primary reason. The suppressing of their desires. Which is not part of our being. Let me burst that bubble for you. It's not part of our being to get married solely, solely for your desires, for the sake of your desires. No. In, in fact, doing it solely for your desires is succumbing to them. Doing it solely, getting married solely for the sake of your desires is actually succumbing to your desires. Allah protect us all from that. No, that's not the right reason to get married. That's one of the reasons and one of the many reasons. No companion came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and says, Ya Rasulullah, I have problems and I need to get married quickly. You know, there's too many, there's too many distractions out there. This world, the Prophet of Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, has told us that, you know, the, the worst desire within us is in fact, Hubb al Is, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that, that the, our, that what we have perceived to be beautiful is the lust and desires that men have for, for women. That's a strong desire and people need to understand that. We can't shy away from that topic. We cannot shy away from it any longer. It is something that needs to be discussed that men, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made inherently within us that men have this desire. <laughs> And it is a job 
for all men and women to understand that. However, that desire, the point of our jihad is to control that desire and not succumb to it. And that means when we get married, we don't get married solely to fulfill our desires. No. This, if you do that, then there's 101 different problems that you're going to have. Because aside from that, when that's all done and dusted, then what have you got? You've got to take care. You have to be gentle for one who is not in this up. You have to see that. And this goes for sisters also. That when they get married, don't think, oh well, he's handsome, mashallah. Huh? Allah subhanahu wa look how beautiful he is. Look at his beautiful beard, mashallah. Yeah? He compliments his cheekbone beautifully. Mm -hmm. You know? You know, he's, he's perfect for me, in fact. Why is he perfect? Because he has such high, beautiful cheekbones. Is that the reason why he's perfect for you to get married to? Or for, for the men, for you brothers? To say, mashallah. Yeah. That in itself, when you're talking about the beauty of a, you're in fact, when you're supposed to be lowering your gaze, khadun basur, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam commanded us to do, we don't do that. And when we want to compliment, in, in fact, when we, we commit zina with our eyes, what do we say, mashallah? Stop the Allah, Allah protect us from that. Yeah? And you know what I'm talking about. Each and every one of you young brothers does. Allah, Allah, she's so beautiful. Allah has blessed her with so much beauty. Look at that beautiful face. Look at those eyes. They're mesmerizing. You know, they put me into some kind of a spell. Surely I need to get married to that sister. Then she's no longer a sister. Eh? Then, then no longer do you refer to her as a sister. This is something that we need to control. We need to suppress. That's why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ordered us to lower our gazes. That's modesty. That's haya. And you know the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that and Iman Bikram was Sakuna or Bikram was Sakuna, the Sakuna Shukla. That Iman is of 60 or, in another narration, he mentioned of 70 branches of faith. Imam al Bayhaqi, a great scholar of the Hadith, he has compiled a book solely of this, calling it Shu'ab al Iman, the tenant of faith. So the Prophet said in this Hadith that Iman is of 60, 70 branches of faith. Iman is like a tree which has 60, 70 branches of it. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam proceeded to inform us that Abdullah Al-Qur'an La Ilaha Illallah that the highest and uppermost branch is to say La Ilaha Illallah There is no Lord Allah Wa Adnaha And the lowest branch of that is Imaqat Al-Adhan Al-Qarib To remove something harmful from the heart Meaning you're walking along the road and you see someone's drop, you know, a, or someone's place a glass bottle in the middle of the road. Yeah? And you take that bottle and you go and throw it into the bin, lest somebody who might be driving past the tar, car, car tire might hit it. It might, you know, break the bottle, puncture the tire, it could potentially be involved in the car accident. Yeah? So you take that bottle and you take it out of the car. That shows Iman. That's one of the branches of Iman. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at the end of that hadith says, when haya al shu'abatun min al iman, that haya and modesty is a shu'ba, is a talent of faith. Haya is a great part of your iman. And when I mean haya, when I say haya, haya doesn't mean blessing in your jubbas, beautiful white jubbas. I'm wearing a nice kufi and tabush, or a nice beautiful hat or umama. For our sisters, haya doesn't mean just wearing your jubba, yeah? or abaya, or having your hijab, you know? or, uh, uh, or even covering your face with a veil, or a khimar, anything. That is not only haya. That is part of haya. Haya is a way of life. Haya is a way of life. Who was out of the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Who was the most modest of them all? Who had praise lavishly bestowed upon him in regards to his modesty? 
you know the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Who is that companion? Sayyidina Uthman ibn Affan radiyallahu ta'ala anhu. And what do we know about Sayyidina Uthman in regards to his hayat, his modesty? Sayyidina Uthman epitomized that he was the perfect embodiment of hayat. That not only was Sayyidina Uthman modest in the clothes that he wore, for the dress that he had, not only was he modest, and modesty doesn't mean that the clothes are loose, loose fitting, yeah? And you know, they're, they're not too tight on your body, that is the only part of modesty. Modesty means that they're loose fitting, and they're not too expensive, they're not too lavish, yeah? They don't cost you hundreds of thousands of pounds, or thousands of pounds, you know? That's also a part of your modesty. Modesty is that only lowering your gaze whenever women are coming. Whenever you see a woman walking on one side of the road, quickly you look down, deliberately, and people say, MashaAllah, look at that brother, look how modest he is. You know, all for the wrong reasons, doing it for the art, showing off, so people see how modest I am. The modesty, in fact, is a way of the now, of showing off, acting modest, you know, acting humble. I'm so humble, SubhanAllah, look at me. No. This is part of Riyadh, this is showing off. It's a, it's a way of man's hayat to take part, take over your life. Say that was man of my friend. was so modest, he was modest in every single action that he undertook. Yeah? He was so modest that, in terms of Say that was man, one of his titles was what? Lahani. Rich. Yeah? Rich, but the clothes that he would wear would have patches on him. That's how rich he is. The clothes that he would wear would have patches on them which he would sew onto them inside. Wow. Even though he had the money to buy the best of clothing, he didn't spend it on himself. He spent it. And, yeah? He was so modest that one day he came into the masjid and he saw a small child. Now listen to this carefully. He saw a small child. And that child was... He looked at the state of that child and the way that child was dressed the clothes were ripped, you know, uh, the hair was disheveled. And he looked at that and he realized the financial position that this child is in. The financial position isn't very good. So he goes to that child and he kisses that child in the forehead. Once the Prophet was kissing Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein and a companion, you know, Aqra ibn Harris, who was one of the Macho companions, you know, like the ones that we talk about benching 150 in the gym, you know, having their handcuffs on and showing their, you know, uh, bodies for the public to see, you know. And uh, we're not going to talk about that disrespectfully in terms of the companions. Uh, MashaAllah, as Sahara, Kulluhum, 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 Udun, as Sahara, the all just. Whichever one you follow, you will be guided. That's the perfect lives that they did. No, they were not perfect, they were not soon. They didn't commit. It wasn't as if they didn't commit sins. But no, the Prophet of Allah referred to them as the best of people. The best of people are those that live in my time. Then those that come after them and those that come after them. Aye, the and the Now this companion, you know, Allah bless him, Radiya Allah and Allah bless him. 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 Allah is pleased with them and they are pleased with him. This blessed companion says, Ya Rasulullah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I have ten children. And Allah, he says this with great pride, I have never kissed any of them. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Man la yakam la yakam. He who does not show mercy will not be shown in mercy. Ayy by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In another narration, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, what can I do if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken rahmah, mercy and compassion out from your heart? And these are one, two of the greatest attributes of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Every attribute of his was perfect. The two perfect attributes of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam were that he was a'uf and he is a'in. Bil mu'minin a'uf al-ra'in, the Quran says. That with the mu'minin, with the believers, he is kind and he is compassionate. Ar-Rauf and Rahim are two attributes of Allah. In this verse, he gives them to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And not only am I Ar-Rauf and Rahim, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to you is kind and compassionate also. Eh? 
So Sayyidina Uthman ibn Arafan, he kisses this child on the forehead and he says, stay in the masjid, I will be back. And he goes out into the marketplace. And he says to the merchant, the cloth merchant, to the trader, what is the most expensive dress that you have? What is the most expensive piece of cloth that you have? And he pulls out this Syrian or Persian cloth, this dress. And he says, Sayyidina Uthman, this is perfect for you. This is the best piece, the one piece that I have. Now I'm sure in London, you know, where you have our Pakistani shop clothes salesmen, you know, Birmingham, Ladypool Road, and all these roads, Adam Rock Road, you know, Adam Rock Road. That's the that's, that's the name of cloth merchants. When you see them, they will say, this is the best piece that we have. You will never find this anywhere else. Yeah? This is the only piece that ever exists of this piece of cloth. And this merchant, he says, oh, man, this is the best piece that we have. This is the most expensive piece. It's come from Syria or Persia. Huh? Said so the old man said, how much does it cost? He gave, he gave him a price. He said, this is how much it is. Yeah? Quoted more than the cloth was actually worth. Said so the old man, he takes the money and he gives it to him. Unequivocally, does not ask him any questions. And he thinks I've sold Amir al-Mu'mineen, the leader of the believers, because he was a Khalifa at that time. I've sold him a piece of cloth that he's going to wear. Finally, he's going to start looking like the Amir al-Mu'mineen. Yeah? Because the Amir al-Mu'mineen, the leader of the believers in our eyes is not one that should be wearing torn clothing or should not be wearing clothing that has patches on it. But this is due to the modesty of this man. But he doesn't take it for himself. He goes and inside that he sews, uh, uh, there's a hidden secret pocket inside that dress. And he puts 5,000 dinars inside it. Wow. And he closes that and he takes that piece of cloth and he gives it to that child. And he said to the child, may I have given you this gift. Now take this to your parents. And when you go to your parents, tell them to examine the dress. Say, look how beautiful my new dress is. So they made sure to have a look at it. And he said, of course I will. Who are you? What is your name? And he said, that's not of value. That's not of worth. You don't need to know my name. I am your brother. But I am your uncle. And he, the child, as would any child be who just received a new, you know, something expensive, colorful, beautiful. To this child it was this dress. He took that dress, he ran straight home to his parents. He puts it on. And he said, look, yeah, I bet you know, you know my father and my, oh, my father and mother. Look at how beautiful I look, look at my beautiful dress. And they're shocked. You know, we can work our entire lives and we'll never be able to afford a dress like this. Yeah? And he said, look at it, examine it. The person who got me this, this, this dress, he told me that I need to tell my parents that they have to examine my dress and look at it. So the parents begin to examine and they see a hidden pocket. And inside that hidden pocket is 5,000 wow. This is the modesty of saying that that when he gave, he didn't want people to know that it was him. And when he gave, not only that, he could have taken that 5,000 dinars and given it to that child or given it to one of his khuddam, one of his servants, and said, go give it to that family. But he knew that he, though that family or those parents, you know, Allah had blessed them with courage. Allah had blessed them with dignity. They were not people who would be begging on the street. Yeah? They were not people who would, you know, regard themselves to be completely impoverished. They were saying, you know, they were from those people who say that in need of Allah to him we shall return. So he knew that their courage was not enough to give them that much courage. That their courage, their humility, their humbleness, their bravery would not allow them to do that. And that's how modest he was in taking that. And look, I said, that man and no fun. You know, when we talk about modesty, let's say modesty in just in terms of your appearance. You know? You know, modesty is when you have the ability, yeah? when you have the ability to express yourself in a certain way. Like, for example, Allah has blessed you with beauty, and yet you cover it up. Yeah? Allah has blessed you with beauty and you cover it up or you don't look at other people's beauty or you lower your gazes. Yeah? You don't try to beautify yourself but further artificially. That's higher. Yeah? That's true higher. And
I think I smile with my friend. You know, you don't know about it. Well, many of us don't know. I think I smile with my friend. Was spoke amongst the most beautiful of the Sahaba. He was one of the most handsome men. Say, Abdurrahman al Hazm, Rahimahullah. He once said that when you looked at this man, you would look at him. And once your gaze was glancing by, and your gaze would find this man, that once your eyes had seen him, your eyes did not allow you to look into any other direction. Your gaze was fixed solely on this man. That's how beautiful he was. He was so modest that when he spoke, Abdul Rahman ibn Hazm said that we would have to go close and take our ears next to his lips to listen to the words that are coming out from his mouth. Every atom of his existence was of haya. That's why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, what haya is shu'batun min al iman. That haya is a tale, it's a part of your iman. It is a part of your faith. Now, how Inshallah, I'll take another five minutes of you. Okay, inshallah. We'll, we'll try to wrap up as quickly as we possibly can. I do understand that you're tired and you must be hungry also. Um, for those of you who haven't seen to do, have been here for a long time. And Allah bless me for that. And the topic of today's discussion was how to miss relationships and how to combat them. You know how we combat them? We could look at the types of marriages that we have. You know? What are the types of marriages? You've got arranged marriage, you have forced marriage, you have love marriage, you have secret marriage. That's a new one, secret marriage. Yeah? Um, you have so many different types of marriage. And we look at them and we see that the ones that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam have allowed are those that comply with the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the marriages that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was talking about when he said, Hindi kahu min sunnati. And they carry from my sunnah, from an rahiba in sunnah, he falls in me. And whoever deviates from my sunnah, then he is not from me. And know that not only is you getting married part of the Prophet of Allah and sunnah, you getting married in the correct way is part of the Prophet of Allah and sunnah also. Yeah? So for the parents, for the parents who force their children to get married, for example, they are deviating from the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, and nikah is from my sunnah. He didn't say that you people who want to get married, nikah is a part of my sunnah. If you don't do nikah like I have done my nikah, or according to my sunnah, then you're not a part of me. He said, nikah is from my sunnah. Whoever deviates from my sunnah, then he is not from me. So by forcing our children to get married, we are deviating from the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There was a woman, Allah bless her for her courage and bravery. And, he, and, and for our sisters, they can take a, a great example and use this woman as a role model. Say, Ya Khinsa, Khinsa bin Dehidan. She came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Radhi Allah ta'ala, and may Allah be pleased with her. And she said, Ya Rasulullah, O Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, my parents, my father, He's forcing me to get married to his nephew. How many times have we heard that? Yeah. An incredible amount of time. Yeah. This is a huge problem in the Indian subcontinent. And no, no, don't think it's just restricted to Pakistan, uh, Bangladesh, and, and Indian. No, this is this is all over. This is a, this is a problem that we have in the Middle East. You know, I was in, uh, in Egypt, and in Egypt we have the same problem. Forced marriages exist everywhere. Yeah. It's not just in any particular nation or any particular country. Forced marriages are happening there. And she came to the Prophet and said, Ya Rasulullah, my father wants me to get married to his nephew. And I am not happy with this union. And the Prophet said, Perhaps it is better for you if you were to listen to your father. This is an advice from the Prophet. She said, Ya Rasulullah, but I am not happy with it. I do not wish to marry you. The Prophet said, in that case, that your nikah is batil. I declare your nikah to be batil. Go and marry him so you wish. And that woman, she smiled and said, Ya Rasulullah, I'm very happy with my father's choice. Ya Rasulullah, I'm very happy with my father's choice. I have no problem with him. I want to get married to him. But I just wanted all the women who come after me to know that their father has no right to force them to 
look at my video. There are 20 in Amakar. This is mentioned by Fatul Bari, uh, by Imam Abdul Muhammad Asghari in Fatul Bari in the commentary of Sahih al Bukhari. If the Maja has written the Hadith also. He gave me that in regards to the whole history of the nation. SubhanAllah, 400 years ago, she came to teach us that we're not allowed to force our children. And yet, we're still going back into the days of Jahidika, you know, forcing our children to get married. You know? Astaghfirullah, where is this, where is this from? Where did they take this from? Is there a cultural norm perhaps? And know that that culture that doesn't comply with your deen is not part of your being. That culture that goes against your deen and your religion is not part of your religion. You are not allowed to have that culture within your families. Look at the breakup of families that happen because of this. You know, ultimately, families break up because of that. They think they're getting their children married and after that their families are coming together. But if they both, the couple, are not happy with each other, then that union can never be successful for anybody. Not for them, nor for the families. And ultimately it's going to break them all apart. But it's our naivety, it's our, our narrow-mindedness that we seem to think that this is a quick we see it, uh, we see it as a quick fix. We think, khair, alhamdulillah, everything will be okay after. No. You have to do it in the right way. No. Secret marriages. Nowadays, I hear of brothers and sisters in universities who are studying or within their professional lives, you know, they meet somebody and they get married in secret without telling anybody, nobody knows that they're married, they would meet up in a hotel room every two weeks or every weekend. Would nobody know you know. The purpose of marriage is so that people know you're married. That's the purpose of it. You know? And when they're doing that, that purpose is not being, that requirement is not being fulfilled if you're getting married in secret because nobody knows. You have to have people involved. The, that's the idea of having witnesses so that they are able to testify that without these two people are married. The idea of why do we have a valima? To feed people, to call them, so that people know that these two individuals are not married. That's the purpose. So we're not. We're going against that, that, that requirement if we're getting married in secret. Love marriages. I see a few people smiling. Love marriages, something else. You know, according to me, I hate the idea of love marriage when people mention love marriage like that. Because to me, every marriage, every marriage is a love marriage. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam married to Aisha radiallahu ta'ala and how the love marriage. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam married to Khadija with a love marriage. To Hafsa, Umul Muqtayeen, may Allah be pleased with all of them, all of his wives is a love marriage. It's just our mentality that we regard, we see love marriages as something completely different. Nowadays love marriage, no. You know, what we regard as love marriage today, dating, that de facto relationship, living together that we all have, that we know of, you know, living together, oh well, yeah, boyfriend and girlfriend for a couple of years, then we'll see if I want to get married. Maybe she's for me, maybe she's not. You know, I could move on to somebody else. This is destroying family structure in society. This is destroying our iman. Believe me, it's destroying our iman. And you know what? We'll never be happy that way. People can move on from one to the other, to the other, to a third, fourth, fifth. How long are they going to keep on moving? Are they going to find anyone? Because they never find anyone who's perfect for them. And you know what? I'm best not a bubble. You're never going to find anybody who is perfect. You're never going to. It's, never, it's not going to happen. You're not going to find somebody who's perfect. Perfect for you, perhaps. This is why I say that a husband and wife should not think about their rights. You know, the husband, like you mentioned about the father who doesn't know, you know, any verses of the Quran, yeah? But as soon, in one verse, you know, the Quran in any Islam. So when it comes to Islam, when it comes to the children, don't you know what Imam Sahib tell you? What Imam Sahib tell you? Show kindness to your parents. 
that they know that. That's the only way to take the bed, the tongue. In the same way, men have the same thing. You know, they come out from the masjid and they hang around and say, this is a right. That, you know, women have rights over men, men have rights over, over women. Then come home and they say to their wives, the mom's upset this. You have to do this for me, you have to do that for me. So when we constantly remind our spouses of the rights that they owe us, yeah? Then that's never going to work. That's never going to work. And you know what? You're going to get about 20 back. You're going to get 20 back. She's going to say, well, if mom's upset, this is the right for the husband as well. These are the obligations that he has to fulfill. How many of them are you fulfilling? It's a compromise. We have to come together on this. It's not always going to be the case that everybody is happy. And you see these brothers here who are married, brothers and sisters, they will tell you that not every marriage is a perfect marriage. You will have quarrels, you will have problems. But the point is, you will get over your problems. Alhamdulillah, you will have fights, verbal fights, nothing more than that. Um, you will have them, but you need to find ways to get over them. That's marriage. That's marriage. That's part and parcel of, you know, of the package that you have. Yeah? And we have to understand that. And if you're thinking that you're going to get married to somebody perfect, and who's going to stay perfect, if you're getting married to someone for her beauty, and she's getting married to you for your good looks, you know, or for your charm, yeah? in wooing the lady. And that's eventually going to go away. There's going to come a point when that beauty is gone. There's going to come a point when your ruggedly handsome good looks are gone. Yeah? There's going to come a point when you're not that charming anymore. What happens then? What happens then? Then that marriage breaks up. So marry for the for the right reason. First of all, deen. And choose your deen above all else. There was a brother who came to me, Allah bless him in Southampton, he was a couple of weeks ago. And he said to me, <coughs> Shaykh, I'm looking to get married. I said, Alhamdulillah, Allah bless him. Yeah? Uh, it's, uh, you know, we should all have that uh, aspiration. And we, we should all want to get married as quickly as possible. Um, and, you know, it's a, uh, the Quran refers to marriage as Agnitaqul Ghaliza. As a, as a sacred covenant, a pledge that you're taking. You don't take it lightly. It's not something to be taken lightly. Oh, well, I just met her on Facebook. Yeah, I poked her, now I want to get married. You know. Or she poked me, she messaged me, and that's it, that's it. We're getting married. That, that, that's not how it happens. That's not the way it works. No. Me and Ghaliza is a sacred contract, it's a sacred covenant. That's why we call it Aqd. We call it Aqd al-Nikah. Yeah? Aqd is a contract that takes every ounce of your existence to be in accordance with it, to be happy with it, to comply with it. Yeah? And this brother came to me and he said to me in South Africa, MashaAllah, he said, and I'm looking to get married, and I said, what, 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 what do you look for in Islam? I just wanted to see what he said. He said, you know what, I don't want to look for much. I wasn't a good person, I was, you know, I was somebody who was constantly, I was involved in the, the nightlife, I would drink, I was, I was, uh, I was an alcoholic, uh, I spent many nights in, in, uh, locked up in a, in a county jail because of that, um, I was on drugs, and I, I, I had many women, I was very promiscuous, but alhamdulillah in the last couple of years I've changed, I found my team, and now, see, the problem is, that I find it really difficult to get up because of Because I want to get married to, I want that wife to break me up for such And you know what, I, don't, don't think that you just wanted to get married to someone just solely because he's going to break him up in the morning. No. But it was, look at the reasoning behind that. First, that Bilal Deen, he was choosing according to Deen. What he was trying to say is, that I want somebody who will complete my Deen for me. Not only be half of my team, she will complete my team for me. And she'll help me in completing my team. She'll help me in that. So all my insecurities, all my bad habits, yeah? all the times that I would do something wrong, I am about to do something wrong, I have somebody there who will tell me, oh husband, don't do that. Yeah? Stay away from that. So he was choosing in regards to Dean, how beautiful is that? What we choose in regards to our Dean? 
So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all me and you the tawfiq and the ability to choose uh, the right of deen in regards to our deen. And before I, uh, I leave, I just, you know, I, I understand I'm going up for one minute at a time. I'm going to take two minutes more. Uh, and I seek forgiveness for that in advance. Um, Sidi Malala Amar invited me uh, today um, and he gave me a welcome which was, of which I'm completely undeserving of. And I'm not saying that because, you know, I think I'm, uh, I'm trying to be humble. And uh, like I said, you know, thinking that you're humble is in fact, you know, uh, arrogance in itself. Believing that you're, help, you're humble, you're, you're writing in my humble opinion. That never existed in the previous uh, books of history and books of hadith. There's no such thing as the fira'i and mutawadi, in my humble opinion. Thinking that your, your opinion is humble is in fact arrogance, showing arrogance in itself. So um, uh, I feel unlike, uh, protects us all from, from, from arrogance, which uh, makes us all humble and puts this humility inside us. What the brother was saying, he was very often. Uh, I'm not going to let that slide, I'm not going to let him say something that I'm not willing to um, so I've killed out in advance. Um, I thank him for inviting me, I see you know, my brother in the UK. Um, some of the, yes, we met this year, but I feel very close to him, inshallah. The beauty of the individual, uh, you're extremely lucky to have him. Extremely lucky to have him. Right. Um, I tried to actually, I gave him a proposition a couple of weeks ago. I'm leaving Southampton, I left Southampton today and I was in, I went to in Southampton to Sheffield and Sheffield and I just came to Wickham and then Wickham and I just quit, had a quick shower and I came to go straight here. So I've been driving all day, I've done about four or five, five hundred miles. Um, and I, I needed somebody who could take over in Southampton. I messaged him on the phone and I said, do you know him? And he said, unfortunately I don't. And I said, well, you know what? What about yourself? He said, no, I can't do that, I'm fine. So he thankfully to your brothers and sisters, he didn't, sister, he didn't uh, accept my, my proposal. Um, and you know, you're extremely lucky that you have to hear much of that. He's a very a beautiful individual, beautiful because of the character and never lost my life. Beautify that character more. Um, and and we, we continue to make that up. And remember, these, these, these people, these Ulama, these scholars that you have, they are, they, they, they are your Buddha, they are your inheritors. They are inheritors of the public of Allah. I'm not telling you to put them on a pedestal <coughs> that they don't deserve. Oh well, you know, imams are coming. We have to turn around, you know, imams are. Your imams are, the problem is that sometimes your leaders should have four points in there. They should be easygoing, soft-spoken, approachable, yeah, and gentle. And mashallah, I've been fighting at you. And I see, I know, I, you brothers and sisters might know uh, Morana and Mar better than me. Um, I haven't known him that long. But I see those qualities in it. Someone who's approachable, easygoing, you know, gentle, soft-spoken, mashallah. Um, and, and the idea is not to do ta'arif to someone uh, in front of them, to praise them in front of them so that, you know, that's, that's kind of fueling the, the, the fire, and shaitan, you know, readily pounces on that. Um, so, khair Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we make dua, uh, Allah bless us with, 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 the, with spouses who are, who, 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 who complete our deen for us, who help us in competing our deen. Um, 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 so we make that dua. And for those brothers who are not married, and sisters who are not married, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you all the ability, give us all the ability to make the an informed choice yeah? and respect this sacred problem, point sacredness. Um, and I thought I'd leave you with the fact that this is actually my last talk for the next two weeks. This is my last talk. I'm not, I, people have invited me next week for uh, in talks here and there. And I said, no, this is my last talk. The reason for that in two weeks, I myself am uh, completely half of my day. I'm getting married myself. So make it hard for me. And it's perfect that it kind of ended when, when Marana invited me. He said, I want to invite you for a talk. A couple of months ago, he said, we're going to have a monthly, we have a monthly series of lectures we have. My uh, brother, uh, Ijaz Shani, coming come as well. Um, and he said, are you going to invite you? I said, hey, inshallah, I'm going to do it. You know, whatever, whatever topic. And he told me last week, that this is, this is uh, you, on Sunday, would you come down? I said, Sunday is fine, inshallah. I'll give you uh, that time. He said, the topic is marriage in Islam. I thought that's kind of perfect. And then he told me, that, you know, I'm going to be married two weeks later. Uh, so, khair Allah, you are here to make the best decisions. Uh, 
uh, to make them all for the right reasons, protect them from harm, uh, and, and uh, you know, keep, uh, again, in regards to our ulama, uh, Allah protect them and keep them among us. Know that your ulama are not perfect. They're not perfect. Yeah? None of them are. They're going to make mistakes like that. Yeah? Do, not, do not think that your ulama are too perfect. You know what? They deserve the, the respect and honor due to the fact that they are our, when we say Imam, Imam comes from the root word Amana. Amana means to stand right at the front, to be right at the front. So your Imams are right at the front in terms of taqwa, in terms of modesty, in terms of tazkiyah, tazkiyah to nafs. They are right at the front. Even though they may not regard themselves as being right at the front. If they did, that would be a problem. Um, but you know, you regard them as people who are, they're, they're the best people from amongst you. So respect them for being the best. They're not perfect, but they're the best on the mind. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala use the people among us. Dua'an. 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 Hassan in this world. We, are, we ask you to give us Hassan in the Akhirah. Waqin Ayah we ask you, we beg of you to save us from the torment of hell, <coughs> from the torment of Jahannam. O oh Allah, each and every brother, each and every sister who is married, O oh Allah, bless their marriage. Bless their marriage with Hayat. <coughs> bless their marriage with dignity. O oh Allah, those of our brothers and sisters who are not married, O oh Allah, give them the ability to make an informed choice when they do get married. O oh Allah, give them the ability, give us all the ability that when we get married, we choose our spouses for the right reasons. O oh Allah, give us the ability that when we get married, we intend that our spouse completes our dream for us. O oh Allah, all those individuals that ask for to ask, for those many of, 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 of them whose names I do not remember, these are my own family. O oh Allah, I ask you, you're the knower of the unseen, you're the alim, alim and the O oh Allah, we ask you for the sake of your mercy, for the sake of your rahmah, to accept all their du'as, all their kindness du'as. Amen. O oh Allah, those of us from Amunsa who are sitting here, our brothers and sisters, whose family members have passed away, those brothers uh, who, who are affiliated with this masjid, who have passed away, all Muslimin, Mu'mineen, Mu'minat, who have passed away from the Prophet of Allah and those who will pass away after us. We ask you for the sake of the honor that you have bestowed upon the Prophet of Allah to grant them Jannah and Sarawas, to grant them a high maqam in Jannah. Allah save them from the torment of, of, of Jahannam. Allah save them from the adab of the punishment of the grave. Allah give them the ziyarah of the Prophet of Allah and in their graves. Allah make their graves uh, around the in the Jannah, make their get graves a garden from the gardens of Jannah and not a pit from the fire, from the pits of hell. Wa akhir ta'an, alhamdulillah rabbil alameen, wa nukhafi l'ubur an'in Allah, inna Allah ala sayyidu min ibad, sallallahu ta'ala ala qaydi khalqihi, wa nuri amshihi, wa zihir khalqihi, wa qasim al-sqayyid, sayyidina wa mawdana, alhamdulillah ala alihi wa sahabihi 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 wa